Time to first byte is a website performance metric that measures how quickly the server responds when a browser requests an HTML document. In this video, we look at the different components that TTFB consists of and what you can do to optimize them. We can see an example of the TTFB page load milestone in this website performance test. To load the HTML document, the browser first has to create a connection to the server that is loading the document from. We can see that establishing the connection consists of three different stages. First, the DNS lookup converts the website domain to an IP address. Then the browser establishes a reliable TCP connection. So if there's any issues with like packets being lost on the way, that can be handled by the connection. And finally, to create a secure connection, the browser uses TLS to encrypt all the content that's being transferred. Only after those steps are complete, can the browser actually start requesting the document itself. You can see that in the request breakdown, we also have a section called TTFB. That is called the request TTFB and applies even to requests that are not for the HTML document. This part of the TTFB metric measures the server response time itself. How long is the browser waiting for the server to respond to the request for the document HTML? Together, these four steps take about 1.7 seconds. And once the HTML starts loading, the browser can also start fetching additional resources that are required by the page, like JavaScript code and CSS style sheets. TTFB is very important for the page load process because the browser can't display any content until after the document has been loaded, and other potentially render blocking resources can also only be discovered once the HTML code has been loaded. So far, we've looked at four different stages of the TTFB, but at least for Google's Corba Vitals metrics, redirects also contribute to the overall time to first byte score. So if you go to example.com and then you get redirected to example.com slash home, that will mean that you have a worse time to first byte metric as two requests are required. You can see that in this example here as well. You go to hire.co.uk, then we are redirected to um, lhh.com, and then finally we are redirected to slash us slash en. So that means in total we need to make two server connections and make three HTTP requests to actually get the document HTML for this page. As we've already seen, the time to first byte metric is not always well defined. Sometimes it refers to the whole process from navigating to the page going through redirects and server connections all the way to the first byte. Other times it just looks at the HTTP request duration itself. There's also an additional complication in the case of early hints. Early hints are a way for servers to tell the browser about potential resources that are gonna be needed to render the page before the actual HTML code is ready. In this request waterfall, you can see that there are two font files that are being loaded early. Now in this waterfall, we've highlighted the TTFB metric in green and that's only when the first byte of the HTML response actually arrives. But this is not always consistent between tools. So some tools might say that the first byte of the early hint actually also counts as the first byte for the HTTP response. So what determines the value of the time to first byte metric? There are two main contributors. One is latency between the browser and the server. And the second is how quickly the server actually processes the request when it comes in. The server response time depends a lot on how long it actually takes to handle the request on the backend. And we aren't going to go into it too much here. However, there are three common reasons why the server response takes a long time. One is that the processing or rendering logic that you have on the server is really complex and takes a long time. In that case, you can use a CPU profiler for your runtime to measure how long each function call in your code takes. The second common reason are database queries. If you make a lot of database queries or your database queries take a long time, then it's going to slow down your server response time. You can log the duration of each query and then see how you can optimize it. For example, by adding additional column indexes in your database. The third common reason are third-party API calls. For example, if loading the HTML from your website also includes an API request to, for example, a third-party billing API, then that effectively means that another HTTP request is nested within the first HTTP request. So that can sometimes take a long time and slow down your page load process. You can also use caching on your server to bypass each of these steps and simply return the already generated HTML code. The other big factor impacting TTFB is latency. Latency partly depends on how far away from your visitors your website server is and partly on your visitors network connection. So if they're on like a 3G device, that will mean that they have a higher latency just to connect to the local cell phone tower. In this example test result, we can see that for, we are simulating a device with a latency of 150 milliseconds. So that means each of these uh, steps takes at least 150 milliseconds. 
because each of these steps, uh, the DNS lookup, the TCP connection, the SSL connection, and the HTTP request, each of those is requiring run round trip. And that 150 millisecond matches with Lighthouse users as well. So if you're running a Lighthouse test, you will always see that you cannot have a time to first byte metric below 600 milliseconds because it requires at least those four requests with 150 millisecond round trip time. There's nothing that you can do to improve the network connection of your visitors. However, you can make sure that requests are handled by a server that's local to your visitor. Let's look at an example of a website that's hosted in Australia. We can run a global TTFB test that tests the website speed from 10 different global locations. In the result, we can see that generally locations in Asia or Australia have a good performance. However, this gets worse as we move further away from the server in Australia. Now let's compare this to another Australian website that is using a content delivery network. In this case, Cloudflare. We can see that the TTFB metric is good all across the world. Partly that's because when establishing the server connection, the browser just needs to exchange data with a local CDN edge node. For the actual HTML request, in theory, it would have to go all the way back to the Australian server. However, this website has also enabled caching at the CDN edge node. And we can see that because a cache was hit, we often get really good TTFB scores under 200 milliseconds. Cloudflare also tells us what server actually served the response. For example, if we request the HTML document from Japan, we can see that the response is served from a server in Tokyo. Using a content delivery network can reduce the TTFB score by speeding up server connections and also caching responses at the edge. To measure the time to first byte metric, you can use the TTFB test that we've looked at already. You can run a free website speed test with Debug Bear, or you can use the data in Google's Chrome user experience report to see how performance has changed over time. This dashboard shows really good data based on Chrome's user experience report showing you TTFB scores, but also cover vitals like the largest contentful paint. You can also use real user monitoring and install a snippet on your website that measures how quickly your website loads for your visitors. This will show you how visitor experience are distributed, what pages are slow, and how TTFB breaks down into different components. You can also see how time to first byte varies across the world and how network speed like latency differs across the world. Go to debugbed.com to start monitoring your website.